segue into the next part. I know this arrival is with a lot of uh, with a lot of hope and passion, and there's a lot of things called survival next, right? So let's find out how we are all surviving as a CEO. And just to set the context, we are all now typically living in COVID times, and there's tremendous change happening all around us. So now as leaders, we can be either behind the change or we can be along the change or ahead of the change. Now, what I'm curious about this is how can each one of you, how, how are each one of you planning to be getting ahead of the change? So that's what this is. I mean, it's not about behind the change, along the change and ahead of the change. Now, I want to hear your thoughts on what are you doing or what are you planning to do to get ahead of the change? Because this normal is going to be the normal for a while, I guess. Be ready to have a chance for another Wayne Gretzky quote here. Stay to where the puck is going. <laughs> but no, I mean, to answer the question, Priya, I, I, I mean, personally, I'm just saying from our business perspective, it's almost impossible to get ahead of it. You just have to be along with it because we, you're, we, we need to be there physically to get things done. You know, we have, if we have to film something, we've got to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, April to July last year was scary. I'm not denying that. We've also lived through COVID with a lot of family members who tested positive and things like that. So we've seen that happen. Mm -hmm. And it was tough, particularly in the UK, things were crazy, closing the office, telling everyone to come home. But what we realized then, there was no revenue coming. So what do you do? So okay. I, I, I still won't say we got ahead of it, but we started doing things like people wanted birthday party videos, anniversary videos, small things like that, you know? which were not going to pay you much, you know, $100 here, $200 there. We started making showreels for television presenters because if for three or four months, there's only cash outflow and no inflow, it's sure. impossible to get ahead of the change in a business like ours where it requires a physical presence. So what we had to do was adjust and say, okay, COVID, we're on this race with you. You're winning, but we're going to do what we can to stay afloat. So I don't think we're still ahead of it because it's going to take a long time, like you said, mm -hmm. but we're just trying to find ways where, where, ways where we can do more uh, smaller gigs and keep our businesses asset light. Luckily, we have no debt, which is a good thing, okay. but unnecessarily not take on too much and just keep it simple and make sure you're cash positive. Correct. Correct. How about yourself, Tony? What's, where, where are you in this wave? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we went from making big party tents to making the exact same tents and changing the name and saying socially distanced tents. Um, so for us, it was a pretty easy pivot this last year. And it's actually been um, a very busy couple of two years. But for us, we had planned to be here with our revenues and ended up here. Um, and so my operations were good at uh, the size we were to 10, 15, 20 employees, uh, but we jumped up to 50 employees. And so a lot of our changes have been internal, um, finding the right people to be able to drive the operation to keep costs in line with, with uh, revenues. Um, and there were just, there were a lot of, lot of things that got thrown at us last year from supply chain to lead times to shipping, um, all of those things. So, um, but I, I always used to view challenges and obstacles um, uh, as a failure. Um, and I actually viewed, I kind of changed my mindset where I welcome them now, um, bring it on, right? Because um, it's going to happen. And it's how you perceive those challenges, I think that really allows you to either succeed or fail lots of the time. Correct, correct, correct. So you're actually saying that last year, you, you pretty much doubled your business. We tripled our business last year. We were, um, so it was, it was a good year. Um, and this year has been uh, just as crazy. Um, so, but it was our, our team taking the time to think through how we could reframe uh, our products with our customers. Um, and they did a fantastic job every single week kind of adjusting to um, what the new set of calls coming in were from different industries, restaurants, bars, um, schools. Wonderful. I mean, how did the reframe happen, Tony? I'm curious to find out how, how did you, you and your team reframe? Yeah, so we started the year and normally the beginning part of the year, we have our rental customers coming in and the rental industry, those guys mostly do events. And so it was dead for the first four months. We took the PPP loan 
um, which uh, in April. And then uh, heading into May and June, we just started getting calls in the sales team and the sales team would communicate over to marketing and say, hey, schools from New Jersey are calling. Um, why don't we focus on that from a marketing message? Um, and so it was just the team every single week. It was a different call from a different part of the country uh, with a different need. And uh, the team did a really nice job kind of um, passing those things back and forth um, to make sure that we were kind of one step ahead. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Very interesting to see how small little tweaks can make a make a big difference, actually, right? Sometimes it's an adage to say, I mean, small change, uh, small steps, big change kind of a thing. But actually, if you do it, it's not all that difficult, right? Yep. Wonderful, wonderful. Good. I'm, I'm hoping the same with you, uh, uh, Bhairavi, because last year would have been a year where all of us, I mean, who said we are sane could have become insane, right? So in just a matter like this. <laughs> We're always insane. I think sanity <laughs> escapes most yes. of us. Um, yes. It was, so for me, um, so a little bit of context in that I'm in my third year right now. So first three years are always like extremely iffy. You don't know, you think you've got a path, you're going and then something happens and then you change sure. and you change and you change. Um, so in 2019, we felt like it got into our groove. So about one and a half years in, felt like we got into our groove. Um, we were making a lot of headway. We, we started doing physical safe spaces. We created this tool called the Mare Kid Riding Out Depression, which was a physical product. We did safe space conversations with it. Um, started off in Bangalore and then moved to Chennai. We had great partners in both these locations, new partners. Um, it, it was going really, really well. Momentum was picking up. Um, we partnered with like under 25, which is like India's largest youth festival. Um, mm -hmm. In the first year, we just did a couple of conversations on self care. Second year, we were like their wellness partner. And we wow. had like this, like, so, so there were a lot, there was a lot of growth that was happening in a great way. Mm -hmm. And everything was face to face and, and you know, um, in person. And then there was a pause. So at this point in time, I have to now figure out what do we want to do? Because with mental health, we've always got this notion of face to face is better than online. And it's the way that we're trained. It's the way that we believe that, you know, when we see people, we could see reactions, all of that. Um, but now we didn't have that anymore. So I had, tough choices to see what is it that I want to digitize because not everything is meant to be digitized. So sure. the Mare Kit, for instance, was something that we were very clear that it had to be a physical product. People needed to hold it, to feel it, to touch it, to feel that connectivity to it because we have so many apps and there are apps that are doing really, really well, but that's not a space that we want to kind of get into. This was a kind of niche that we've got for ourselves. We're happy with it. And the people in our community, in the Mitra community are happy with it too. So that was one conversation that we had with different community members. We did a bit of sensing, saw what it was, said, okay, great, instinct is right, let's not do this. But there was now a lot of options for safe spaces. So um, the physical safe space that we did was called Let's Discuss the Mayor that moved online. Um, and we started a doodle session. So Advaita came on board, our creative facilitator, and we started a doodle session. And what ended up happening was um, we catered to people that we would never have thought uh, we would see in, 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 in Bangalore or Chennai. Um, we mm -hmm. had people joining us from different parts of the country. So in Kashmir, where there was complete total internet blackout for some time, um, there were people who were literally on edge, like they were on 2G data, who were joining in on the session. Um, there were people joining from in any space that they could find, which was private, because in lockdown in Indian homes, you're not going to get any privacy. So you'll see stairwells, you'll see balconies. Um, middle of the summer, there were people in the terrace in the heat because they just needed a space to speak. Equally, you had people who were completely lonely, distant from their family, distant from those that they loved, didn't know what to do. Um, and, and all of this kind of meshed and came together. And it just was very instinctive and we kind of met the need. And for us, since things are constantly changing, um, it, it wasn't anything about the change. It was just about what were we going to do now with the given sort of scenarios? And in all of this, we're also funded. So funding sure. issues were there. We went ahead, we, we didn't have any funding that was coming in. We said, doesn't matter, we'll just do the work. And uh, it worked out great because then we got COVID relief funding that did come in and that supported us and that's continuing to support us uh, for a few more months. So in all of this, what happened was we realized that there were two huge groups um, that were extremely marginalized. 
And usually, you know, when you look at not-for-profits, especially in an Indian context, they look at hunger, they look at education, they look at hygiene, sanitation, you know, that, that, so when you think of mental health, it's probably homelessness or treatment um, yeah. or, you know, social, emotional kind of skills learning. There's nobody that's looking at um, college students whose entire lives have just changed dramatically. Everything that they worked for doesn't exist anymore. They don't know what to do. Um, the rates of self-harm went up. The rates of, um, you know, just loss of life dramatically increased grief so much of anxiety so much of depression um and it, it it was very draining we were all flat out maybe 17 18 hour days for a while because the need was just so high and this is not doing therapy holding safe spaces doing group sessions different kinds of tools that we were offering um and with all of this we saw that uh, the queer community and those who face gender-based violence they became very clearly the people who kept coming back, coming back, coming back, because we'd managed to create a truly safe and inclusive space for them. Um, was that something that we set out to do? No. Was that like a clear path that we had? No, it happened very organically, just because we looked at the concept that we had, which was very broadly safe spaces and access to free tools and resources. Wonderful, wonderful. I've been trying to come up with um, good things that have happened as a result of COVID. Um, and I think one of them is the willingness for people to, to do telehealth or telemedicine. Um, I think there's a lot of great resources in cities. Um, and then, but in the rural areas, it's really hard for people to get somewhere um, if they have to drive an hour, who's gonna go to an appointment at two o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. So um, I think that's a um, fantastic resource. And then um, I'm assuming you've even worked with people outside of India, um, so. And, and we also did a lot of work for, um... The, the not-for-profit space because you know in the first three months here is a group of people their entire being is tuned towards going and helping and they're not allowed to do that so their beneficiaries the people that they engage with day in and day out are dying of hunger and starvation and they're not able to go and help them so the amount of pain that they were facing and and it's what they do that that is their life's purpose it's their calling they're not able to do it and usually in the dev space, if you look at it, people look at their own needs the last, you right. know, it, it's always everybody else. So even if like salaries are delayed, it's always about the cause. And it's about making sure that the people that you're serving continue to get served. And that was continuing to happen, but at a huge detriment to their own health and safety. So we offered these sessions again free. And um, there were a whole bunch of organizations that we ended up engaging with and different languages. So I was Bervi Ben. <laughs> There was like a Gujarati group that I supported. Um, I had a Gujarati translator with me. Um, same for Hindi groups, same for Tamil groups. I had these translators with me and we tried to do what we could to tell them that it's okay, you know, this is unprecedented for you in the space that you're in. There is no, um, there is no rule book for you to do anything at this point in time other than take care of yourselves. And because only when you do that, we don't know how long this is going to last, but then can you get activated to help others? But at the same time, India was going through a huge humanitarian crisis. We had like migrant laborers walking hundreds and thousands of kilometers, dying of just hunger and starvation. So wow. um, there, there was just a lot happening on different fronts, which we were trying to help, uh, which was also why like really long work hours. But as, as the year kind of, I think maybe by August, September, it started tapering down a lot. And we were just able to focus on our core uh, area, which was the mayor session. So doodles for the mayor, and that's discussed in there. Wonderful. Yeah, also what, what's nice to hear what, with what Bhairavi and what Tony said and even our own journey is that, yes, it was strange. Yes, it was crazy and unprecedented, but I don't think any of us threw in the towel or wanted to throw in the towel. You know, that's quite cool. And I think it's hard because a lot of times in entrepreneurship during these times, you'll be like, man, this is enough. You know, I don't want to do this. Let me just give, go get a consulting job or do something else. But that's what is happening. Like to what the amount of work Bhairavi has done and how Tony has been able to double and triple his business. At no point did they also feel it's over, which is really cool. And that I hope a lot of people take but, but, away. But Vero, to kind of correct you there, it wasn't, there was still a lot of consulting work that I had to do because of we course. didn't have funding coming in, right? So I had to find some way to support not just myself, but the team. So sure. I was able to do that through some sort of corporate engagements, like the goodwill of a lot of people to be like, yes, like we will give you this. We'll do a mental health session here. We'll do a mental health session there. 
and that kind of helped our company kind of go through that time until that covid relief funding came in sure so no i meant it was like burning where... the... sorry go on go on. no no okay. no i meant in the case where you quit and get a job in yeah, consultancy yeah yeah so yeah, completely yeah. off yeah. track and get yeah, another yeah. job yeah. Yeah, that yes so. yes yes but that's interesting a word that i can catch on is called emotional bank accounts i think that's what kind of it's like doing something unconditionally and you don't know when it pays back right i think that's always i think should be something that we all invest in because we don't know how life is a full circle and it will come back sometime <laughs> Barry, I think you you highlighted a great thing um, that I think is a reason a lot of entrepreneurs burn out, um, and that's that they're not filling up their own cup, right? Um, and you mentioned the the nonprofit leaders who are focused on everyone else and not themselves. And I always thought it was selfish to focus on myself, um, but if my cup's empty, I can't pour in anyone else's cup. So what what good am I at that point? wonderful wonderful and it's uh, it was interesting i was reading that japan has actually got a minister for uh, for for uh, for to deal loneliness. with the the i think what the crisis loneliness. the loneliness crisis right so it's interesting how there are there are lots of areas that we choose we tend to ignore or we take it for granted but it's actually becoming an issue in these current times right yeah, it's crazy that in Japan someone could be lonely, but it's it. I completely see how it happens. But uh, there's so many people there, and you're like, well, how could you be possibly be lonely? But it's um, it's really easy um, to be lonely in these times. Yeah, and, and those are the conversations in India as well, Tony, where you know parents or family members, well-meaning, would be like, oh, but what kind of mental health issue could you have? Everything's great right now. Or yeah. you know, you have running water, you have electricity, you have all of these things. What's so bad in your life? Like, keep looking left, keep looking right. all of these yep. people are dying and you're okay but that's when we realize that you know stigma today is no longer about oh depression is bad it's about just denying um within your own like circle of friends and family that it exists because when you look at something like loneliness in, in a culture that's just so close in, in terms of society family friends whatever it is chosen or biological um rates of loneliness are going up that they're really shooting up with with young indians especially and they're starting to understand that there's something wrong there's something wrong with the sort of socio cultural systems that we have and they're not able to uh find um comfort they're not able to express it they're not able to talk to um elder family friends whoever about it and understand but then when they come to a safe space and they're like oh my god you feel that too okay i'm not the only one and that just gives them this sense of okay it wasn't just me i'm not the only one going through it and automatically just that relief flows in and you can just see that entire being just become lighter it gets super powerful and they can't mm-hmm. discuss that at home right i'm guessing a lot of them yeah, can't yeah it's very unfortunate yeah there's a tick box if everything is there you've got this you've got this you've got this how can you have a problem which yeah. is so silly And it yeah. starts so young, no, Viru. Like yeah. when, when, when we're children, we're told not to waste food because look, there are children on the on the road who are like starving. So and and that just carries on. Like, what do you mean you have depression? Like, what more could you ask for? You have a loving family. You have all of these things. What more could you ask for? You're just making it sure. up, or you just want attention, or sure. it's not real, or go lose weight and work out and do yoga and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wonderful! Yeah, what I'm getting is that it's important to be vocal and take support, right? Irrespective, I mean, be it uh, specific issues like mental health, but be I, I think in an entrepreneurial journey, it's instead of going as a tortoise into the shell, it's important to be out and open to seek the. It's like uh, there are magicians around you, and you may have to kind of. you know it walk the walk them closer to yourself because they're there are you ready to even spot them so that's actually one of the ways that i got through this period so um i did a change maker program with this group called the amani institute and there are global change makers from across the world and i would reach out and i would be like this is what's happening like i don't know what to do these are all the feelings that i'm having i don't think i'm worthy to lead this organization um these are all the things that i'm struggling with and there's just this community of love and support and warmth and people coming in and saying i'll help you with this i'll help you with this and they pretty much then become the wind beneath your wings you don't have to be in it alone um but also learning how to ask for help and identifying those support communities are very very important because sure. it's it's learning it's peer to peer learning but it's also peer to peer support 
Absolutely. with people who are in very similar things because they want to change the world too and changing the world is not easy 